a good day to all of you and welcome to living multiculturalism with mayank bhat you're watching tag tv the program has been brought to you by the canadian thinkers forum friends today we have with us a group of people who are involved in a project that is very unique it's a kind of project that we have never seen before in canada i will leave for the participants to talk about it but let me introduce them to you first catherine gauvier is an eminent novelist and has been an activist in immigration integration for almost two decades perhaps even more we have with us two other participants from the project camilla and resha welcome to all of you thank you man thank you man. wonderful to be here thank you so let's begin with you catherine what is the project what is the shoe project describe and kind of explain to us the shoe project is a writing workshop for newcomer women uh, which uses the idea of a shoe to talk about uh, the life journey of migration uh, we uh, share stories um, support each other in in the adaptations that are required to canada and we um, perform for the public so um, many people can know about these wonderful women and what they've gone through and what they're bringing to this country and, and for how long has the project been going on project began about four and a half years ago when a, a, a private sponsor who was actually a reader of my fiction um, came to me and suggested that she would sponsor some kind of program if I wanted and what would I like to do and I said that I would like to work with newcomer women to help them uh, improve their writing in English so that they could take on leadership roles be, uh, become part of the mainstream so the I cannot take credit for that was my idea uh, the the brilliant stroke was adding the shoe and that I don't take credit for so who how who gave that idea uh, it was a completely serendipitous moment at a dinner party where um, the sponsor and I were describing what I wanted to do. And uh, the uh, woman seated next to me was Elizabeth Semelhack, who is the senior curator at the Bata Shoe Museum here in Toronto. Uh, it's the preeminent shoe museum in the world. And she pitched in and said that she had always wanted to do an exhibition at the museum about shoes and immigration. The idea being, these are the shoes I wore to Canada. So that's how it began. And, and so over the last four and a half years, you have had different batches of women yes. who come and participate? Yes. So what sort of a background do these women have? Uh, these women come from all over the world. They are anywhere from 18 to 80. I don't think we've ever had an 80 year old. We've had some in their high 60s, which I like very much. And they, they may have been writers or artists or dancers or puppeteers or, or, or students in their previous country. They don't have to have an artistic background, but they have to have the desire to express themselves in this new language, to really sort of inhabit this new language and be able to say who they are. That's, I think that's really the main criteria. So we, we, we build a group, uh, we make, uh, we are, I take great care that they come from all corners of the globe. Um, and we meet, uh, you know, weekly for a number of weeks uh, to develop stories, to get them written, and eventually to practice uh, uh, delivering them in public. So each, each of these are individually chosen for what sort of talent? What, what are you looking for in, in the participants? Uh, well, I think they are all talented, um, but we don't necessarily know that. We just are looking for someone with that drive to express. You know, someone who is not content to have the kind of English that can fill out forms, or get a driver's license, you know, read the newspaper, but who really want to inhabit the language and, and be able to use it to, to define themselves and to say what they want in this world. That's, that's what we, it's, 
that's the real criteria, that, that drive. You, you use a very nice phrase, inhabit the language. Yes. I want you to expand on that. What, what does it mean to inhabit a language? Well, uh, maybe Camilla knows, or Rasha can say this better than me. I mean, I inhabit English. I, I, I was born in English, you know, I'm, I'm not multilingual. And I'm, I'm amazed when I sit in these workshops and see people from the Chinese, the Russian, the Arabic, you know, the alphabet, the whole grammar of that kind of working, coming to bear on these items, shoes we have in the middle of the table to talk about. You know, this it's amazing kind of mental gymnastics going on there, right? But to inhabit the language, you need to, to feel the rhythms of it. You need to have a sufficient uh, confidence to sort of open yourself up to it. You know, it's a kind of, it's a kind of dance, isn't it, speaking a language? More than the ability, there is also the need for confidence. Yes. How does that come about? Well, I think I, I see so much confidence grow in the, the women of the shoe project. I think they build it themselves. I mean, they, they become friendly with each other. They see that other women have the same feelings and fears. Uh, they just use the language more and more. They, they bring into it a passion and an emotion and a personal kind of, um, you know, they breathe into it their personal stories. I think, I think once you've done that, you just get stronger and stronger, you know. And so, so one, of the, one of the events that I attended, actually two of these uh, at the Arts and Letters Club, is a sort of a grand finale to everything that has been going on for the last several months. Yes. And each of these uh, women, then they give a sort of performance. Yes. I wanted to describe that. Well, we've become quite ambitious. We used to do just small little exhibits at the Bata Shoe Museum where the shoe would be in a plastic case and the story would be, you know, exhibited and people would say a few words. But we began working with the voice and dramas coach and we've now got photographs and music and dance and uh, the, many of the women astonishingly to me are confident enough to get up on the stage and and really you know blast away you know give their story to the public you know asking for laughs and and tears and the, the whole work so yeah they've become very dramatic evenings it's very moving for for the general public to hear someone speak personally about their own story. People used to say to me when I wanted to put these on stage, they'd say, oh, well, get actors, you know, get actors to read the story. Well, no, that's the whole point. They're not actors, they're real people. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're speaking in their beautiful accents and telling their own story, that, that's powerful. Is, is the decision to have uh, women from different cultures a deliberate one or was it just accidental and then you kind of kept on building on that? No, it's 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 very deliberate. Um, you know, we don't we don't want them all to be from, say, Syria. Although we love our our members from Syria, and we will obviously have more. But the idea is to is to learn. So if if you're seeing a woman who grew up under communism in Poland talk about the kind of shoes that they were issued by Russian, um, you're learning something. This is a whole new world. Um, uh, that kind of exchange is basic to it, and I and I think it really enriches the stories. I have known you even before. I mean, I've been here about seven and a half years now, and, and I've known you for a major part of that period. Uh, and I've always seen you involved in some way or the other with with newcomers, and and be very very passionate about their integration into the Canadian society. What drives you? I think it began when I was president of Penn Canada and uh, saw that, well, we would bring, um, help to bring a writer who'd been imprisoned in China or, or in Cuba uh, to this country, that once they were here, because their English wasn't that perfect, they were delivering pizzas, you know, and that was shocking to me. And, and it seems to me, Yes, it's a passion. We need these people. We want, I mean, here, you're a cultured person. Uh, so are Russia and Camilla. They're interested. We need these people to be active in Canadian culture. How can we leave you out? How can we not make it, you know, really significant? 
as, as part of our endeavor. I, I just think it's so obvious. It, it, this may probably be a political question and I don't know how you would answer that, but, but don't you think that when we talk of multiculturalism, it should always be a two-way street. So, you know, there is a lot of effort for Canadians to understand newcomers, but is there enough for newcomers to also understand Canada? I hope so, and I really think you are right. I really do not want in all of this, in us embracing um, the Vietnamese, or the, I don't want the history of this country to be lost, the stories of the original settlers in this country, the way we are different from other countries. We have to know that, and I think that partly in the SHU project, we are producing Canadians who really understand that, we don't go through chapter and verse of the War of 1812, but it does have an effect of making the newcomers feel that they're part of the culture. And reading, reading the books, talking about the books with each other, you know, going to the theater, the art galleries, it's all part of joining up. What's to join? We have to tell them what's to join. Where do they sign up? You know, people have to know that. It's not obvious in this country because we don't, broadcast Canadian culture that blatantly. Would you agree with that? We, my experience has been that a lot of this has to come from within. Yes. If, if you are passionate about knowing your new land and if you want to belong to Canada, like you know, most newcomers, they want to belong. Yeah. So the effort has to be the individual's effort. Yeah. The institution help can only come if the individual is committed to making that first, mm -hmm. taking that first step. Mm -hmm or has the courage. And I think people, especially perhaps women, sometimes are caught within a community and within a home and without the language skills. So they may want really to participate, but they don't, they don't have the, you know, they don't have the opportunity. You have made that point earlier also in one of your discussions that it's, the story is missed because, you know, people don't want to talk about it because mm -hmm. there are so many other compelling things that they need to do as newcomers. Mm -hmm. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I, you know, I, I've talked about this. I think that sometimes the, the emotional side, the, the traumatic side, the, the, the fa family side, the, the, uh, the intellectual side of um, the immigration journey gets silenced. You know, it's too urgent to, to, to get a job or to, you know, buy the shoes or have them join the gym club or whatever. I, and I read this in the paper just the other day. Someone was interviewing some Syrians in a camp who were um, about to come here. And the, the husband said, you know, we'll do this and that. And the wife said, I'm afraid. And the husband said, no, no, you can't say that. You don't, you don't say that. And I think that's something that happens. You know, it might be 10 years before She's really going to tell us what she was afraid of. But that's an urgent story. We need to, what, why should that be lost between languages? That is true. Friends, we are watching Living Multiculturalism with Mayang Bhatt. You're watching this program on TAG TV. The program has been brought to you by the Canadian Thinkers Forum. I'm going to now move on to our other participants. Rasha is from Syria. Rasha, what made you join the SHU project? Hi, I'm Rachel Indari. I'm here um, studying, I'm doing my PhD in Middle Eastern archaeology. And uh, a friend of mine, um, uh, Hint Kabawat, was a participant uh, in the project and she told me about it and if I'm interested to join. At the beginning, I was not sure about uh, the idea of writing a story about a shoe and a personal story. But after I went there and uh, met Catherine and uh, the group, it was, it was way more than I expected. It was a cultural exchange experience, a therapy session, and um, a learning experience, of course. So I'll go there for sometimes two and a half, three hours every week and just talk about our personal experience is that it's hard for us to um, express in another language, especially when we talk about some sensitive topics and all that. And there was 
um, Kat Catherine's role to um, encourage us and uh, support us to, um, you know, no, be confident. You can do it, and I'll help you. And sometimes it was hard um, for me to talk about my personal experiences, uh, but uh, through the shoe project, I am. I feel now more confident, and uh, I feel I'm talking now more about my personal uh, life. <laughs> Are you? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. I like to see when it happens outside of the project. You know, I notice things in our meetings, but then I hear, oh, you know, Russia's giving introductions to lectures and mm -hmm. all on her own. So it's fantastic. Camilla, what about you? you you're from Bolivia. Yes. Thanks, Mayank, for having invited us. Um, yes, I'm from La Paz, Bolivia. My name is Camilo Riona. And uh, yeah, I'm part of the project. And I'm very happy to be um, part of it. And I was introduced by a good friend to um, a member. My friend is Freddie Bellis. I think that Catherine, you have yes, met him I before, know. or he was a Freddie student was, of yours. Yeah. And he introduced me to uh, one of the members, Elizabeth Meneses, and she introduced me to Catherine. And then that's how I landed um, in the project. And it's been a great experience. It's about um, sharing, it's about learning, about um, meeting new people, meeting um, women that have gone through the same path as I did while coming to um, a new land and discovering a new land. And we all have different um, stories, but in, in the bottom we share, I think, the same um, in the emotional side. We've been through a lot of things and, and the, the shoe project has become uh, a place where we can share that without the fear. Um, Catherine was mentioning something before about that, like you don't have to be afraid of anything when you are there, when you're sharing your story. And especially when you're writing, I don't know if you shared that with me, but when you have to say something in a different language, in, in one that's not yours, and you know that you have to inhabit it, yeah. <laughs> then it's not as, as easy as you think. But um, Catherine has helped us all, I think, um, in doing that. So it's been a great experience. Thank you. Catherine, I, I want to get back to you and I want you to talk about the shoe that we have on the table here. Well, this is a shoe that was brought to the shoe project by our youngest member. Her name was Ferwene Berahani. She came um, smuggled out of um, Eritrea with her mother and younger siblings after her father, her father Aaron, um, was, he was exiled for, I think, publishing a newspaper. He was, and his partners were jailed and I think have probably died in jail. Anyway, they, it was a very dramatic story. Um, this is a... The, uh, it's a handmade sandal made of goat skin with little beautiful little shells sewn on and it's something that a young girl would wear on a special occasion to church or to a confirmation or um, perhaps a, a someone else's wedding. Uh, just to look at the example of a shoe, what can we say about that shoe? When we're in the shoe project, we talk about the feel of it, the shape of it, the, the smell of it, what does it sound like when it hits the ground, you know, all of, all of these things. But why, what would a shoe occasion us to think of? You know, we, we, can, we can see that in this humble object, it's a humble object, it's a basic shape. Um, we all wear shoes something like that. It'll be a flip-flop or a sandal or it'll be from Brazil. It's called a Havaiana. It's, you know, it's, it's a classic um, shape of something you put on your foot. Uh, so everyone can bring some association to that. Um, but a shoe is also, it, it tells of transformation, doesn't it? It tells of movement. It tells of crossing the globe, um, moving your, the place where you stand to another point. You know, this is a shoe that you wouldn't think would be very useful in Canada. It, it tells us about the land of Eritrea, the weather of Eritrea, uh, uh, you know, the customs of these people. So it's an eloquent object. 
It's an eloquent, there's so much to say when you have a shoe. So, I want to get back to the whole discussion about multiculturalism. You, you have, uh, you know, people from different cultures. Uh, we used to have in Canada what was known as two solitudes. Mm. Uh, do you think that it has been replaced by a multitude of solitudes? That, uh, except in a project like yours, where you have people with, you know, from Canada, as well as people from other backgrounds, mingling and understanding each other's cultures. Mm -hmm. We are basically just a two-culture phenomenon. So, I, if I am from India, then I know India, Indian culture, and I know or I try to know Canada. Mm -hmm. So, I am kind of oblivious about the other cultures mm -hmm. that inhabit mm -hmm. this part of the world. I wonder about that. I, I, you know, I say to people, oh, you're from Toronto. Oh, yes, yeah, Toronto's a fabulous, multicultural city. Well, yes, in, in the question of restaurants, we are very multicultural. Um, are we in the question of uh, theater or, or, you know, neighborhoods? Um, people do tend to group with their, their home culture. Um, I love the shoe project, well, for many reasons, but I learned so much. I learned from the Russians, the Chinese, how, you know, I didn't know this. I mean, we had a young woman who is still part of us, who is a, one of the, she's a female child from the Chinese one child policy years fascinating to hear her experience. So for me, it, it's travel, it's introduction to all these communities, and, and maybe, you know, maybe there isn't enough of that. You know, maybe we don't find enough occasions to mingle with the, somebody from, who's come here from Turkey or, or from Sudan, the South Sudan. It's, 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 uh, I don't know. There, there are certain exceptions to that. We have one member, Tinaz Javad, who lives in Mississauga, here, near here, and her neighborhood is, is a vast multicultural map. You know, there's Jamaicans and people from India and, you know, Africa and everything, all mixed together in some of these newer, newer uh, suburban developments. So I'm not sure the story is all negative, but I, I certainly think we need more of this. And, and how, how does, you know, it, an, an, an individual like you who's committed to this cause will find new ways to do this periodically. Mm -hmm. You were involved with training internationally trained writers earlier. Mm -hmm. Now you're doing the shoe project. Maybe you'll do something else in the future. Mm -hmm. But there is a certain, and I don't know whether you would agree with this assessment, is that there is a certain lack of institutional support mm -hmm. to these uh, endeavors. Yeah. So how do we make sure that, you know, that kind of becomes a part of the process? I, I don't know. We, we have not gone to government for any money. We, we are going to expand the shoe project for Canada's 150th birthday, which is, so we've now got a year and a half. We're preparing a big um, proposal that will take the shoe project national and will try to, you know, when put other writers in my position and other voice coaches and so on. Uh, so we'll have groups in Halifax, Toronto, maybe Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver. So we are trying to do that. But it, I do find um, it's a kind of new idea, strangely, and there isn't, uh, a, there isn't an obvious way to fund it. It isn't obvious how to, I mean, this is volunteer for me and for many, many people who work on it. It's always been volunteer. It's just something we really want to do. Maybe this whole thing with the Syrian refugees coming, maybe there will be more. I, people need to, to think a little more about immigration. It, it, it's not just that they're, they're coming here, they're going to arrive, they need a house and a blanket and a, and a mattress. Uh, it's that it takes years, it takes 10 years. It's all the adjustment, it's all the, the new skills, it's all the feeling of welcome, and, and it's all the sort of showing people, these are from ancient cultures, they're beautiful cultures, but we have a culture too, you know, and we need to, to share that. Definitely. I'm now going to be asking and or rather inviting our other two participants to read from the work that they were they have done for the show project. Let's begin with you, Rasha. Okay, I'm going to read um, part of my story, and um, uh, they can uh, people can look us up uh, on Facebook, uh, the Shoe Project Toronto, and. Uh, 
there are there will be videos of us telling the whole stories um, I'm telling a story told to me by my older sister Manya who is now inside Syria running an organization to help internally displaced people escape violence in their cities here it begins the middle class office workers in Damascus were a big part of the Syrian revolution, a fact Assad's like to keep hidden. When secretly planning their after-work demonstrations, these workers used a code. Are you running today? Mania asked when she called her friend Alice. After work, Mania took off her work shoes which are usually three or four inches high. She was just like most other Middle Eastern women who loved their heels. <laughs> then she put on her running shoes. She met Alice, who was still in her heels, which made Mania worry. How could Alice run in these heels? But she didn't have time to tell her, as they were joining the march on a narrow street in the old city they were marching toward the famous square of Thomas Gate, one of the seven remaining Roman gates surrounding the ancient city of Damascus. Mania and Alice were among 150 youths, peacefully protesting to demand an end to the bloodshed in other cities, and chanting, we want a civil state and dignity, we want justice and freedom. They had not marched for more than a few steps, before they were surprised by some shabiha, what we call Assad's thugs, who were everywhere, undercover, lurking around, waiting. The shabiha started attacking the protesters, using sticks and throwing whatever their hands could reach, even chairs and tables. They were overpowering, chanting, Long live Assad! The protesters, scattered in all directions. Some survived with no harm, others were beaten and tortured. Mania took off into a full speed run. Images of dark cells and instruments of torture filled her head. She got lost, but she was thankful for the narrow, tangled alleys the old city provides to freedom runners. Her senses heightened. She could smell the scent of jasmine everywhere. She could hear her, her heart throbbing and her running shoes clapping against the ancient basalt cobblestones. Racing through those streets and architecture, she thought about Damascus' long history and the fascinating stories each brick could tell about the Assyrians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Umayyads. Are they still following me? She wondered. What if they catch me and arrest me? What would they do to me, to my family? She had heard the stories of women who got tortured and raped in Assad's prison. Will I make it to my wedding next week? Good thing I wore my running shoes today. Mania thought. She had told Alice to wear hers too, but Alice said she didn't have any. She hoped Alice was still behind her. Thank you. Thank you, Rasha. Camilla, I invite you to read now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my story is about love and how love brought me here to Canada. So here it goes. To God slash universe, I know I will find the love of my life. He's out there and should not be delayed any longer. He's handsome, tall, funny, smart, and has a noble heart. He has nice hands and beautiful eyes. Oh, and I'd prefer him to have some gray hair. I consider that sexy. Thank you. For a long time, I repeated this mantra every night before going to bed without knowing I had already met the love of my life. Years ago, my friends tried to match us, but I was not interested in any kind of relationship then. Some months later, he moved to Canada. I didn't hear from him until he came back to La Paz 
for a short vacation. We married only 15 days after we met again. He went to Canada the day after the wedding. I waited back home for a long year to get the visa and the sponsorship process to be completed. Medical exams, police background checks, certificates for every little thing and proof that ours was not a fake marriage. Finally, the time to leave arrived. I didn't know how I was going to fit my whole life into only two suitcases, where to start, what to bring, what to leave. In the middle of my debate, my mother entered my room and handed me a beautifully wrapped box. She had wanted me to get married no matter what, even if that meant I had to leave the country. As she knew I was worried about the future, she chose the perfect symbol to encourage me, a pair of boots. She had looked for the best place to order them. She found the store hidden in a small shopping gallery downtown La Paz. The owner, a young businessman, copied his designs from fashion magazines that his craftsman, an old and experienced shoemaker, replicated to perfection. The price was good and they came with a one-year warranty. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much, both of you. Catherine, I want to bring the program to a conclusion by okay. asking you about your forthcoming novel, which is going to be published uh, in uh, March 2016. Yes, it is. Yes, I've been, um, my other activity, other than the shoe project, is, is writing novels and I have, uh, Finally, after many years working on this novel, uh, this is coming out, The Three Sisters Bar and Hotel. Uh, it is, I call it Chekhov in the Rockies. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, a story about the uh, original uh, outfitters, uh, uh, one original outfitter in the Rocky Mountains and a, um, a, an expedition that was lost uh, where Three generations later, these these deaths and disappearances are still haunting a, a family which has stubbornly female children always. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yes, uh, this is a return for me. I've written quite a lot of, that was set in Japan, and uh, I'm now returning. This is this is the area where I grew up, the, near the Rocky Mountains so much easier to do the research when you understand the language. I don't speak Japanese, so this has been, it's been a real treat for me. Um, and it's kind of international and multicultural too, because the Rockies, um, from the moment that they were, quote, opened by the railroad, were a kind of mecca for people from all over the world, scientists and artists and, uh, runaway aristocrats from Germany and uh, there was mining there so there were Italians and Polish uh, and Ukrainian miners who came to live so it was a real uh, polyglot kind of uh, life there uh, complete with with horses because all the exploration was done by horse so anyway that's the book coming out I'm, I'm excited about it B before I conclude I want to ask you a question that has been kind of with me for a long time Okay. You've been trained into martial arts. I did, yeah. So why was that? And what kind of fascination did you...? Uh, it, it was at the beginning of my, uh, my Japanese fascination. You know, when I was um, young, I, was a, I, I danced a lot. I was, I've always liked, I find it's a very good uh, alternative to sitting and writing, is doing something very physical. This is sort of, you know, gets your blood moaning. And, so. and at one point in my life, I had really kind of lost my my moxie. I, I, I had gone through a divorce. I had two teenage children. It was actually my daughter who said, Mom, you're really going to like this um, kobudo. It's Japanese martial arts with weapons. And the first weapon I used was a very, very long wooden pole called a bow. And it was, it was like a dance. Uh, but the best thing about those martial arts is, is not the fighting or the you know, banging around, but the focus, the concentration, and the, the kind of, uh, I really got my, it's really how I got my groove back. Now I always, it's, people always say, oh, you're a black belt. Actually, I, 
I'm, I'm a lapsed black belt. <laughs> <laughs> Quite far lapsed at the moment. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us today. Friends, uh, we were watching A Living Multiculturalism with Mayank Bhatt on TAG TV. The program was brought to you by the Canadian Thinkers Forum. As I always say at the end of the show, this is your program. We can make it better with your suggestions. Please write to us, make your suggestions. We will go the way you want this program to go. Thank you. Number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV.